What's up? Hey, growing. You were not here for the first session? Okay, back. We'll begin in a minute. Just uh, again, <clears throat> thank you for coming. Thank you for being patient with me, tolerating me and my imperfections, trusting that Jesus uses me to bless you. I think growing, you're going to really enjoy this session, the previous one, because I went in depth on the differences between the major branches of Christianity and how the Lord Jesus permitted the church in believing doctrines that many condemn today, such as infant baptismal regeneration, communion of saints, perpetual virginity of Mary, demonstrating that these doctrines must have been acceptable, permitted by Christ to allow all the major branches of Christianity the world over to believe them so early on. So you're going to really enjoy that. We went really in depth. I think it'll bless you. <clears throat> One thing I do ask, please pray for me for the following. Okay, here. Pray in Jesus' name that I never become a crowd pleaser, that out of my soft spot or willingness or desire to be loved, I compromise the truth, pervert the truth, water down the truth to be loved by men. Ask Jesus to protect me and shield me from that. So pray, number one. I don't compromise or prostitute myself for the love of men, for fame or money in Jesus' name. Pray also in Jesus' name. See, Christian, before I finish, this is why there are divisions in the church. It's people like you that will come here and say, Orthodox is the real church. And then those who are Catholic or Coptic or Protestant are going to start attacking you, say your church is corrupt and evil because of your mouth. Right? You catch that? You see that? What you just did, Christian? You have Orthodox brothers and sisters here who believe their church is the true church to respect others and do not condemn them and see them as brothers and sisters. Uh, what you can say is don't say anything because you're going to embarrass yourself and I'll embarrass you. I promise you I will. I'll use the same fathers against you if you're going to be a smart aleck. I will humiliate you. See, that's the problem. And I'm trying to avoid that. You get what I'm saying? No, you're telling what you think is the truth, but in your myopic vision, you're a fool. I'll tell you why. Guys, let me deal with this loudmouth so I can send him on his merry way. 100% spot on. You're born in an Orthodox family, right? Christian, you're born in an Orthodox family? Look, I'm going to embarrass this guy here for being stupid enough to come and attack us. Yeah. Watch. People don't learn. It's unbelievable. Were you born in an Orthodox family? Okay. Notice what a moron and an idiot you are. Because you were born in an Orthodox family and you supposedly rejected it, but somehow, coincidentally, you came back to discover it's the true church. Gee, I am shocked. You'll hear the same stories from those born Roman Catholic or Nestorian who will say, yeah, I, I was born Roman Catholic, but see, I rejected it. And just somehow in my search, I ended up finding out it was a true church. You see how stupid you sound? No, it's not you rejected and found out it's true. It's because you're Orthodox, you just reverted back to what you were taught to be the truth. Is this guy stupid or what? So you're going to use Hank Hanegra. <laughs> Hey, uh, growing and nada, this guy's a disgrace to your particular communion. It's And guys, is any not confirmation of what I said in the previous session? Guys, did you remember that, right? Tell me that he's not a godsend. Guys, tell me he's not a godsend. Did I not say in the previous session you have jerks from every major branch of Christianity that give a bad name <clears throat> for their particular denomination and group? Did I not say that in the previous session? I said you got Roman Catholics to do that? You got Orthodox who do that, Coptics, Protestants. We're all guilty of it. And this moron comes as if it's predestined and designed for him to come to prove my point and confirm my case. See? Send this, this rabid dog on his merry way. Admins, come on, my brother. That's why I made you an admin, Riaz. All right. Send him on his merry way. Thank you. 
uh, you see, uh, NBA world, I don't know if you're stupider than him. Who told you I'm trying to win someone over? Are you that stupid and mentally challenged? And if you want me to quote scriptures where the apostles and prophets treated idiots like you, the way you deserve to be treated, would you then shut up and stop talking? Who Do you think I'm trying to win this guy over, moron? When I'm being rude to someone's because I'm not trying to win him over. I'm trying to get rid of him because he's an agent of Satan to try to bring division. So why would you be so stupid, number one, to call yourself NBA world if you're a Christian, and even stupider to think that this is how I'm going to win someone over? Are you that stupid? Tell me. I want to know if you're stupid or maybe, you know, then I can excuse it. But if you think you're smart, then I have to show you that you're really stupid. Yeah. All right. I want you to answer me to show me, are you, were you born stupid or did you work hard at being stupid? Which one is it? Were you, did you come out of your mother's womb stupid or you were born, you, you worked hard at being stupid and ignoramus and ass. And do you want me to show you scripture? Right. Where the apostles and prophets didn't tolerate schismatics, heretics, or those who thought they knew and but put them in a place like I'm putting you in your place. Yes, Vine, it's a double session. Sorry, brother. You're going to love the first session, Vine. You will really love the first session. But even before I started, agents of Satan came in. But we're going to clean house by the blood of Jesus. Go ahead, Riaz. You're my admin for now. Send them on their merry way. Send him back to Asheron. Right. Okay. Yeah, so first of all, pray what I ask you to pray. Pray for me. Okay. Sorry, I don't know. She's talking about. So okay. Also, then pray for the following. Here's what I need prayers for. I'm asking you guys to pray. Never compromise for the praise of men, for fame or money, that Jesus will save me, that I speak the truth to the best of my ability from, from a heart devoted to Jesus. Please. I'm not trying to be ecumenical for praise of men. I'm not trying to be ecumenical. I'm trying to be honest with scripture. Pray also that Jesus will help me. I'm asking you how to pray for me. If you believe that I'm your teacher for now, God is using me, that God will help me overcome my weaknesses, my flesh, to crucify my flesh and walk in the life of the spirit, freedom from my flesh, because it becomes a struggle. It is a struggle. Loneliness <clears throat> is a struggle. Desire for companionship is a struggle. Not having my children is a struggle. But Jesus is Lord. He is alive. He is God. And his love and peace and joy sustain me in spite of what I may be feeling, in spite of what my flesh tries to do. Sorry for the noise. You're going to hear some noise because the computer is cooling off, right? So pray for that, that I don't shame the Lord. I don't blaspheme the Lord. I don't fall into scandal. Please, Lord Jesus, because better men of God have fallen into scandal and shame the name of the Lord. Thirdly, do pray for my children, that God will love them as only he can, keep them healthy, and let me see them and raise them before he calls me home, if he's pleased. And pray the Lord will always provide our daily needs. Now, yesterday was such a bad day, and I'm going to begin. I just want to share with you, because you're my family, how to pray for us. Because, guys, you're, you're seeing warriors on YouTube, Christian Prince, David Wood, Anthony Rogers, but you don't know their personal struggles. You don't know the trials and tribulations. You don't know the satanic onslaught. You don't know the problems they go through. So don't make them more than they are. Bathe them in prayer, fast for them, that the blood of Jesus will be our shield, our covering. The blood of Jesus will cover our loved ones, and the Spirit will seal us. Because I can tell you, every one of these brothers, not just me, we're going through something major. That apart from the grace of Jesus Christ, we will fall. It is a miraculous testimony to the love of Jesus that we haven't fallen. And I'm being honest. I'm just being honest. There are things I know about these brothers that they haven't felt. Uh, they, I'm not privy to share because they haven't shared it. That you'll know it's a testimony that Jesus is alive to sustain us. And just by way of uh, <laughs> testimony, you saw what happened to me last night, the attacks last night. Muhammad Hijab thinking he's a tough guy. And folks, listen, I'm not a tough guy. I'm not a, I'm not a warrior. But God has given me a temper, a fearlessness. When I get threatened, I'm not afraid. It actually gets me angry and makes me want to do something to defend myself, right? Christian Dan, listen, let me say something about my ex-wife. 
It's not that she's a true devil. She has been deceived and controlled of the devil. Since you mentioned it, I don't want you to vilify her. It's easy for me to vilify my ex-wife because what she did. But here, let me be fair. She was, she's, she, she was raised in a broken home. She had been abused. And because of that abuse and brokenness, Satan has made her life hell. I have yet never seen, and I'm being honest because I want your heart to break for her. Not trying to be pity party. I've never seen a woman full of hate, anger, rage, depression, and sadness. She was constantly sad and depressed because she was under the oppression of the evil one. So don't hate her because of what she did. Your heart should break for her. And it's coming from a guy that's hard for me at times to want to be loving towards her because she destroyed my family. She left me homeless in the cold where God brought people to take me in. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'll be honest with you. I'm being honest with you guys. There are those moments in which I think of what happened to my daughters. I'd say them and I get angry. I want to hate her. But then God checks my spirit. To be honest, she is a human child. She is a human child. So I'm about to cry when I say this. <clears throat> She is created in the image of Christ. She's created for the glory of Christ. And no matter what she has done, Jesus loves her and died for her and desires her restoration. And folks, it's hard for me to say this. I'm being honest because I've lost my kids. But when I think of her condition, I'll be very honest. And I'm not trying to play a hero here. I'm not. I'm being honest with you. No, I'm not even a true angel, honestly. I, I'm not. When I think of how hard her life has been, and even me, uh, uh, by way of testimony, I failed in being Jesus to her because you guys can see. I get angry. I get impatient. And I'm not trying to justify it, but it will come out like I'm trying to justify it. I have never been verbally abused the way I was abused for 10 years, and I didn't know how to handle it, right? And so there are times in which I lost my testimony and I cussed her out. And then I would ask Jesus, please, Jesus, I'm losing my testimony. I'm failing to be Christ to her. Either change me or change her or both of us. Help me. I don't want to shame you. So I, there are many times where I lashed out in my anger and cussed her out. Because then, I'm not, again, it sounds like I'm justifying it, but it's being honest with you. I have never had a woman abuse me verbally the way she did. It was unreal. And the reason why is because she had been abused, she had been hurt, she had been disappointed, and she was looking for her father in all the wrong places because she didn't have a father, right? And she was looking for him. And so her desire is to find a man who can be the father, but then that anger and hatred comes out, and then she pushes people away. So she's a broken vessel, and at the same time, she is the mother of my children. And at the same time, my children adore her because she's a wonderful mother. You know that? When I used to see the way she loved my kids, I would like have to go around the corner and start crying because <clears throat> the way she loved them. Right? So keep praying. I have my friend who's concerned for me saying, don't tell people that. No, I'm just being honest. Uh, my brother, I know you care. I know you care, Aziza. I'm telling them so they can pray for her. I know this brother loves me and I love you. You know you are. I, you know I love you. But I'm trying to tell them, don't make her out to be the devil. Just pray for her. Pray for her. Right? She needs healing. She's broken. Folks, do you think if she's in love with Jesus and Jesus transforms her, she would be like this? Okay. Do you think if she loved Jesus, she would have done this? She would have walked away and had an affair or <clears throat> sought to destroy me? Of course not. She doesn't know Jesus. But imagine if she breaks and falls in love with Jesus. She will re reason, realize her sin and regret what she did and repent and ask God to have mercy on her. So don't hate her because of me. Because remember, there are two sides of the, to the story. I've tried to be as honest with you as possible, right? But at the end of the day, she needs Jesus. And if she falls in love with Jesus, you know what? All this will be passed. We'll become best of friends and we can raise our kids in the love of Christ. When I say raise, I'll be honest with you. I have no desire to go back to her anymore. 
that ship has sailed. But it doesn't mean I can't be her brother in Christ and she can't be my sister in Christ and raise our kids if she breaks down and falls in love with Jesus, right? So I don't want you to vilify her. Let me just uh, put on the air. Uh, the, I don't want you to vilify her, right? right? I don't, listen, my friend, I'm an imperfect vessel with sin, sins, right? Jesus is the perfect God, man. And Jesus, even when it came to his companion, no, never I love Jesus. Come on. that You insult me and you hurt me. I love Jesus. Their sister, if you're a sister or brother, you really hurt me when you say that. I've never cheated on my wife. In fact, even before I became a Christian, I never cheated. That was something I hated with a passion. So I don't know why you asked me that. I'm going to assume that you're asking me sincerely. You didn't mean to attack me by that. Why would you ask me? Did I, how could I then be doing ministry in front of you if I was an adulterer? What kind of question is that? No, I never was Muslim. Jason, you nailed it. She does have narcissistic personality disorder. Man, you are good, bro. Man, you're good. And those who know, narcissism is a disease beyond human cure. Only Jesus can cure it. Right? Only Jesus can cure narcissism. I'm being honest. Narcissism is a disease beyond human cure. Humans can't cure it. But Jesus can because he's God Almighty. There is no disease that he cannot cure. And I'm saying it honestly. And unless and until the Lord heals narcissism, if you're in a narcissistic relationship, if you're in a relationship with a narcissist, I feel sorry for you. I feel sorry for you. I pray Jesus helps you because I'm telling you, unless Jesus intervenes and heals that personality disorder, your life is hell, and that's your cross until Jesus takes you home. I'm being honest. I feel sorry for you. Okay? I feel sorry for you. <laughs> oh, man, I, I hope, I pray, neither the woman nor the men are married to narcissists. Neither the woman nor the men here, I pray God has spared you from that. Because I'm going to say it again and we're going to get into the topic. If you have unfortunately married a narcissist, only the grace of the Holy Spirit can secure you and preserve you. Your life is hell until God heals that person or he takes you home or that person walks away and destroys the marriage. There is no human cure. There is no human cure for narcissism. Uh, I love Jesus. Can I expose you as a filthy dog, a son of Satan, for worshiping a false god that you think is the triune god? Can you? Can you now answer questions so I can expose you as a daughter or son of Satan because you don't worship the God of the Bible, but your God is Satan? Can I prove that? Are you, are you willing enough to defend your God? Are you, are you ready? Because I have a question you won't answer. I'm going to embarrass you in less than two minutes. You ready? See, this is what happens. The dogs of Satan come out, and I muzzle them. Aren't you glad that the Lord gave me somewhat of a temperament not to be wishy-washy and muzzle dogs for the glory of Jesus? No, Timmy, she doesn't have full custody, and you have to diagnose mental disorder, and she's never been diagnosed with that. And, Timmy, let me just be frank with you. You don't know how corrupt the legal system is. It is almost impossible to prove that a mother is unfit to raise the children and the courts are on the side of the women. It is impossible for a man to get a fair shake. I'm not lying. Anyone here can testify who's gone through it, and I hope you haven't. The courts are set up to destroy the men. The courts are set up to destroy the men. It is honest to God truth. And I happen to be in one of the most wickedly liberal states, one of the most wickedly liberal cities, Illinois and Chicago, and they're notorious men eaters. And it's almost impossible to prove that a mother is unfit. And forget about adultery. They have passed a law called no fault law. Even if you commit adultery, they say, so what? As long as it doesn't affect the kids. What do you mean? It, divorce and adultery destroys kids. And Sai Christian can testify. Now, I'm going to expose this dog of Satan, this filthy rabid dog. Quote to me a source 
from the Babylonian religion. Guys, hold on. I'm going to muzzle this dog because this dog is of the devil. I love Satan. You don't love Jesus. You love Satan. Right now, quote to me, provide a source where the Babylonians worship one God in three persons, not three separate gods, a God, a goddess, and their offspring. This just shows how stupid you are. Even Satan, your father's smarter than you. But I'm going to embarrass you for everyone to see. Show me the source that says in Babylon before Christianity, they believed that there was one God in three persons as opposed to showing me pictures of three separate gods, typically a God, a goddess, and their offspring. But see, you're, you're, you're a rabid dog. You make your father proud. Answer my objection before I muzzle you. Sorry, guys. I got a clean house, so we're going to begin. See these stupid children of Satan? They think they're smart. Give me the reference now. Okay. I'm sorry, Cruz. Uh, gee, I apologize. Here, here, here. Here, let me make your day. Oops. See, my friend Cruz doesn't like this mirror. Darn mirror. Darn mirror. Shame on you. How do you distract Cruz? All right. Come on. I love Satan. That's not my question. I'm going to show you where God uses the plural, you wicked dog. Answer the question. You said that the Trinity is Babylon, Babylonian. Quote a reference where in Babylon they worship one God and three persons, not three separate gods, God and goddess and their offspring, that you then satanically try to present as similar to the Trinity. Come on, you dog. You're barking, but I don't see no bite. We're going to have to muzzle you. Come on. Then I'm going to embarrass you with Mark 12. Hello, hurry up. Get ready, admins. Just muzzle this dog because you see we just exposed this son of Satan. Okay, now muzzle this dog. You see, you wicked, filthy dog? And they wonder why I'm not popular. Send this dog back to his father. Folks, I want you to learn something. Don't ever fall. Don't ever fall. Okay. For the lie that the ancient Near Eastern religions had trinities of their own. Okay, you're listening? Listen to this. I want you to learn. Samuel, it's okay, man. It's righteous anger to muzzle dogs to protect the flock from them. Samuel, we have a responsibility that those who are weaker in the faith won't fall for their lies. That's why I'm doing this. Out of my love for you guys and the love of Christ. Okay, now. You're going to hear people say that in these ancient pagan religions, they had trinities. You know what you do? Guys, are you ready? You know what you do? You say, quote me a source where the Babylonians or the Egyptians had one God and three persons. Don't give me images of three gods, typically consisting of a god and goddess and their offspring, because there are also images from these ancient pagan religions of four gods and five gods, but you conveniently only quote those pictures or show those pictures where there are only three gods grouped together, whereas there are other pictures where there are four gods or five gods. Why don't you quote them? Because it's convenient to give me an image of three gods as if this is somehow the precursor to the Trinity when those three gods are separate gods, not one god in three persons, and typically it's a male god, a female god, and their offspring, and that's the precursor to the Trinity? You see why that dog changed the subject? Went to Mark 12? You got it? You see why they changed the subject? So don't fall for it. Call them out. Oh, really? They had a trinity in Babylon? Show me. Show me their trinity. They can't. They're just parroting like rabid dogs of Satan. And by the power of the blood of Jesus, we muzzle them for the glory of Christ. Amen? Right? Okay. Now, that said, I gave you some things to pray for. Please, if you love me for the sake of the Lord, pray. And let me just share this. The attacks yesterday were vicious. From Muhammad Hijab thinking he's a tough guy, and he's not. Let me just, for the record, I hope he's a, he's a little girl. And I promise you, I'm not saying I'm going to do anything. I will not harm a fly unless I'm attacked. And in self-defense, I have to defend myself by the grace of God. I promise you, if you were standing face-to-face -to, -face to me, he wouldn't be running his mouth. 
that's the promise, right? And he's told me, let's go fight in the ring. Friend, I haven't been in a gym in years. You want to fight? Give me a year to train. I promise you, after a year, I'm going to make Muhammad cry in his grave. The guy thinks I'm afraid. That's why I told him, why don't you just see me in the street and attack me? Because when you attack me in the street, it's called self-defense. And when I take you out, I don't go to jail. But he knows better. I promise you, he knows better. He knows not to do something. I'm not a tough guy. Sai Christian can tell you. But I'm not afraid of physical threats. I'm not. If I was afraid of physical threats, I wouldn't be showing my face on the, on the screen. The only reason why I don't give away my location is I don't want other people, family members, to be hurt. Why should a family member of mine be hurt by what I do? You get my point? You see what I'm saying? Why I'm going to jeopardize the safety of others that are not involved in my ministry, right? And let me tell you who's a warrior. David Wood is a warrior, okay? David Wood is a warrior. Anthony Rogers is a warrior, right? You know why? Because they're not afraid. They show their face on screen. And you know who's the ultimate warrior? Volcab Malone. Do you know why Volcab Malone is the ultimate warrior? You know you have to have guts and truly believe in Jesus to play Muhammad in Muhammad's boom boom room, knowing they'll be after you. And that tells you we're not afraid. I'm being honest. I'm not a Superman. I'm not saying I, you know, I'm Superman. Yeah, I can be killed. Of course I can be beaten up. I'm not Bruce Lee. The only guy who couldn't be beaten up right here. In an all-out street fight, no rules. That's the man, baby. Bruce Lee, and they call me G. Lu Lee. This is the dude in an all-out fight could not be beaten. Contrary to what Cy Christian says, Bruce Lee pwned Chuck Norris, baby. Okay. See, I know a medic's going to say that. See? Okay. okay, what's my point? I'm no Bruce Lee. Okay, so I get beat up. And did I claim to be Bruce Lee? But here's my point. Here's what I'm trying to say. Get to Here's the point. Do you really think we're afraid of physical death and of physical violence? If so, do you think we'd show our face? You think we'd be walking in the midst of Muslim cities and Muslim crowds? It's Jesus, our God, who makes us fearless. It's because of Jesus in his almightiness, he makes me fearless. So when someone said, I challenge you to fight, oh, I'm shaking. Oh, I'm scared. I am so scared. Thai Christian, can you protect me? I'm scared. Can I? Come on, dude. Grow up, you little wicked jihadi coward dog. Right? He won't debate me, Mashayim. That's what I made a condition. I made a condition saying, I'll fight you and your boyfriend, Adi Dawa. Give me a year to train, but we're going to have a debate before that where I debate both of you. He goes, no, we fight first. If he was really confident, why didn't he challenge me to the debate? Isn't that a little suspicious? You challenge me to legal fight, but not a debate. Why? How does beating me up prove that Muhammad is not a pervert, a son of Satan, an adulterer. Can you explain that to me? Okay, he beats me up, right? Let's see, I'm not Bruce Lee. I can be beaten up. How would that then prove Muhammad is not a sick pervert who prostituted women in the name of temporary marriage, a pedophile who sanctioned pedophilia in his Quran, who raped captive women and is a son of Satan? How does that prove that? How does that prove that? All right. Now, with that said, may Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glorified. But just to let you know how how bad of a day it was, I kept getting attacked by the Mohammedan trolls. You're scared. You're scared. Put the cat. <laughs> put the cat. You're scared. And then on top of that, I had a family member attack me last night. Let me read part of it. And I knew it was the devil. Right after I finished the live stream, I went to a Bible study. I wasn't teaching. Someone else was. But... A family member unleashed on me because of his own sin. And look what it says. You're such a piece of, and I'm going to give you the G word, crap. Right? You you begging people for money, shameful. He even accuses me of begging people for money. Can you believe that? Because we're in ministry, and as ministers, we depend on God's provision through the people of God. A family member attacked me. And got really nasty and low with me saying, I beg people for money. Can you believe that? And I knew what it was. Yesterday when I got this text message, I prayed. I said, please, Lord Jesus, 
please help me and save me from these attacks. Save me from my flesh. Because when I keep getting attacked, I get sad. I get depressed. And then my flesh starts kicking in. And I need victory. So keep praying. Keep praying because I get attacked all the time. I need your prayer. Honestly, I don't. I, I do. Folks, you don't understand how much the people of God need your prayers who are in ministry, full-time ministry. You don't know how much your pastors, your elders, these apologists need your prayers. You don't know how much Usama Dakdok, Christian Prince, El, El Fadi, David Wood, Volk, all of us, all of us need your prayers. We need strong Christians to bathe us in prayer, to plead the blood of just plead, plead the blood of Jesus to be our covering and the Holy Spirit to shield us. We're constantly being attacked, not just by, not just by, let's say, enemies of the gospel, like Ali, Ali Dog Boy right here, who barks like his prophet, but also by people who are close to us and even professing Christians, right? So, Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, bless this session. Please save me from sin, error, confusion, stammering. Empower me by your spirit to recall scriptures correctly, interpret them correctly, and fill your people here with wisdom and knowledge and insight from your Holy Spirit. Save us from attacks of the enemy. Surround us with the wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. Cover us with the blood of Jesus, that the blood of Jesus will be our shield, and shield our loved ones, my daughters, with the blood of Jesus, and seal them by your spirit, Father. And give us favor with the powers that be. Favor here, Father. And provide for our needs. And help us to love you more passionately. To love Jesus more passionately. To love your spirit more passionately. And to be holy. And please help us in our weakness, Father. We need you. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life. <clears throat> and save me from confusion. So I don't confuse them, but love them. The Church of Christ. In Jesus' name, we pray. Hell of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay. Admins, do me a favor. Any satanic distractions, just muzzle them quickly because we don't have time for the nonsense. What I'm going to do is I'm going to continue discussing what it means to be a son of God. Are you ready? I hope despite yesterday's distractions, and it was long, those of you who did listen, where you were still blessed. Soldier Christ, how can I forget you? Why would I forget you? You were still blessed, right? Especially Vine, who asked me the question. Vine, did you get some clarity on what it means to be a son of God and the various nuances of the term son of God? Right? Was that clear? Because I want to finish it today. I want to finish the discussion today. I know, right? First and last. Folks, do you see it's working? I put new names, Muslim names, and Christian Prince, and Christian Prince is making me famous. I'm getting ex famous at his own expense. <laughs> well, Soldier of Christ, if you're going to contact me to attack me or criticize the way I do things, don't contact me. But if you have help, then yes, you can contact me. I'll give you my email later. Vine, depending on how you define the term children, Vine. If you use the term children of God in the sense that God has created all beings, and in that sense, he's the father of all beings because he creates them and gives them life and provision, of course he loves his children. Right, Vine? So you're going to have to be more specific in how you're different, defining the term because did you remember yesterday, Vine? You remember yesterday? There's a sense in which not everyone is a son of God. Those who by grace believe in Jesus are transformed to share in Christ moral incorruptibility and physical indestructibility and his inheritance. And not everyone is a son of God that way. Remember that vine? And then there's a sense in which only the Davidic kings, the De De uh, what they call Davidites, Davidic kings, are sons of God. And that David and his heirs to his throne on earth, the moment they took the throne on earth to represent Jehovah, they became God's royal son. Do you remember the different nuances of meaning? You guys remember that, especially Vine? Just want to make sure Vine is getting it. Yes, but Vine, before you tell me what you're looking into, it's all right. What I'm trying to say is you understand there is different nuances of meaning. So if you're telling me the children of God, meaning 
in a general sense, that all whom God has created gives life to them and provides for them. They are children of God. And does he love them and care for them? Of course he does. Of course he does, Vine. Let me give you a passage that teaches God's love for all his creatures, not just those who are in covenant relationship with him. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Which, yes, no. Jojo, it's going to be the context. You can tell me what the Greek word, Greek words for son of God are, or Hebrew words. That still doesn't tell you anything. It's the context. Now, Matthew 5, 43, 48, let's read. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Why? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. See, if you love your enemies, do good to your enemies, and are kind to your enemies, you show you're a child of, of your Father in heaven. For he maketh, your Father in heaven makes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Right? <clears throat> For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans, the tax collectors do the same? And if you salute your brethren only, if you only salute those who salute you or are family members, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so do? Don't they also greet their family members? So how, how much different are you from a tax collector? Because in the Jews, to be a tax collector was the lowest of the low, right? A Jew to be a tax collector. Because you're working for the oppressors. You're working for those who are oppressing God's people, right? Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven and perfect. Okay, now let's break this down. Do you see it says that if you love your enemies, are kind to your enemies, <clears throat> you know, pray for those who spitefully use you, you show you are a son or daughter of your Father in heaven. You see here, being a son of God, again means someone called to share in the nature of God, characteristics of God, <laughs> mimicking God's characteristics, Imaging God's quality, such as his love. So you guys see that? A child of God in this context means someone who reflects and partakes of the nature of his father. Okay? So oftentimes the term son of God in the scriptures refers to someone who's called in covenant relationship with God through faith in Jesus to share in God's nature and to image, reflect God's qualities. So since the father is the father of love, God is love, and he loves even his enemies, when you love your enemies, you're sharing in God's characteristics, his nature, reflecting his qualities such as love. Right? You're getting it? So how does it tie into what you asked me, Vine? Why would the father let his son shine on the wicked and the righteous and make it rain on the wicked and the righteous because the wicked and the righteous are his creatures that he created, gives life to and sustains and provide for their needs, which makes the rebellion of the wicked even worse, right? That though God created you, cares for you, loves you, provides for you, your response is to oppose him, to defy him and walk contrary to his will so your act of defiance is even worse in light of all the love that God shows you. Right? So to answer your question, of course he loves all his creatures. And in one sense, all creatures are his children because to be a son of God does mean, and oftentimes that's the only meaning given to it in the text, refers to someone that God has created, given life to, whom he sustains and provides because it's a creature whom he loves. So in that sense, God is their father. They are his children. So in that definition, every creature that God has made and gives life to is a child of God. And that extends even to the spirit realm, right? Are you guys with me so far? 
Now, I'm going to ask a challenging question for you to answer. You just read the Lord saying that one of the proofs that the Father loves even the wicked is he provides for them. He gives them their provision, the sun to keep them warm, the rain for their crops so they can eat. That's a sign that the Father even loves the wicked because even the wicked are his creatures that he created for his glory. Right? So what's the sign that the father loves someone? Provision. Now, you have to be careful here, though. The reverse is not true. Even though the sign that God loves someone is provisions and taking care of them, the reverse is not true. The opposite is not true. What if you find someone who's homeless? What if you find someone who's sick? What if you find someone who's being persecuted? That doesn't mean God doesn't love them because there's another force at work in this world, Satan and the kingdom of darkness. And Satan, his goal is to make the lives of humans miserable and to destroy the peace of Christians, the peace of the church, in order to get them to turn against God. So the verse is not true. What do I mean by that? If you are suffering, you got a disease or you're homeless, that doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Because if that's the case, then that means God didn't love Jesus because Jesus suffered hell on earth and took the punishment of our sins on the cross. So from an external appearance, that would mean that God hated Jesus, which is exactly what the unbelieving Jews thought. The unbelieving Jews thought that Jesus was accursed of God, which is why he was nailed to a cross. But we know that's not true. And that's what Job's unwise friends assumed, that you must be being punished of God to go through the hell you're going through because you have sinned against God and God hates you. Am I making sense? So a sign of God's love is that he provides for you and cares for you. But the opposite is not true. If you're homeless and struggling or you're sick or you're persecuted, that doesn't mean God doesn't love you. So we have to be careful, right? No, Job wasn't sinless. No one is on this side of eternity. So I want to be careful here. So once again, a sign of God's love, even for the wicked, is that he blesses them with health and provision and allows them to prosper. But it's not a sign that God hates you or you're cursed necessarily if you're struggling financially or are homeless or in prison. or No, that doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It can mean God is disciplining you because you're in rebellion and trying to get your attention and restore you. Or it can mean Satan is after you and wants to destroy you because of how much God loves you and how much Satan hates you. Come on, guys. Let's pray that over 200 come. We had last time. I like that number over 200. Clear? Just want to make sure. I got to be clear. Trusting the Spirit to fill me and guide me to speak truth without error. Jonathan, that is one of the most profound statements you said, Jonathan Doodle. Through suffering, we can love more deeply. Can I confirm that? Do you know when I see, when I hear someone who, let's say, has been raised in a broken family or whose marriage has been destroyed or whose children have not seen him or her, you know, it makes me want to cry. Why? Because I can sympathize with that person because I'm going through it. It is so true that God allows us to go through suffering so that we can then sympathize with those who are suffering like we do. And you know where you find that? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. Let me show you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. A profound statement. Let me show you. Just yesterday, folks, let me tell you something. I, in fact, I'm, I'm almost started crying, okay? I can't mention his name, but let me read the passage, and I'm going to ask you to pray for him, but I won't mention his name because he hasn't given me permission to mention his name. Okay, now watch here. Read 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 6. Shlama, Anoshka. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. And boy, I can amen that. In spite of my pain and sadness, loneliness, he still gives me a peace and a joy to sustain me, so he does not allow me to give in 
May he never allow me to give in. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. See what, what you just read? God comforts you so that you can then be comfort to those who are going through what you went through. By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us. Notice what it means. We imitate Christ not just in the way he lived, not just in his glorification, but in the way he suffered. You want to reign with Christ? You're going to have to suffer with Christ and suffer like Christ. There is no gain without pain. Right? So I, not only do I share in Christ moral incorruptibility, physical indestructibility, but for me to attain that, I have to first walk in the sufferings of Christ, suffer the way he did, and be nailed to a cross like he was. Right? For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounded by Christ. The more you suffer, the greater the consolation you receive from the triune God. Now notice six. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted. Now let me explain what he just meant here in verse six. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, if we are consoled or we suffer, it's for your sake. We're enduring this to make sure you get saved. You know what he meant by that? Do you know why I'm running for my life, Christians? It's because I preach the gospel to make sure that you get saved. Do you know why they want to kill me? It's because I'm preaching the gospel so that you can get saved. Do you know why they threw me in prison? Because I preach the gospel so that you can get saved. Do you know why people hate me? Do you know why I'm homeless? Do you know why people threaten to kill me? Because I'm preaching the gospel so that you can get saved. So in my sufferings or my joy, it abounds to your salvation. I mean, here, let's just go with yesterday. Why in the world would I allow myself to be threatened by a Mohammedan? Why in the world would David Wood risk his life to be threatened by Mohammedans? Why are missionaries risk? Because Jesus called us to preach the truth at all costs so that Muslims and others will hear the truth and get saved, even if it means we have to suffer, be imprisoned, beaten, and killed for it. See what he's saying? And in spite of that, God Almighty is more real than we can imagine, gives us a peace, and he consoles us and preserves us and tells us, it's okay. It'll be over. Don't let this overwhelm you. Don't let their threats scare you. Don't let imprisonment deter you. Don't let your disease discourage you. Because none of this will destroy you and pluck you out of my hand. None of this will consume you. I will preserve you through it. Right? Do you think I like to hear some six foot eight dirtbag lowlife street thug jihadi scum threatening me? Do you think I like that? Do you think I like to hear a family member? Accusing me of begging people for money. And I'm a disgrace for doing so. Right? You get my point? So then why do you do it? You know why I do it? I'm compelled to do it. What do I mean compelled? Folks, my flesh would rather go find a very lucrative job. Lucrative job where I can make tons of money, go live in a mansion, and enjoy life. That's what my flesh will do. But something in me does not allow me to walk away because I cannot imagine not glorifying Christ, preaching his word, teaching others, being used of God, and loving Christ. I can't imagine it. I try, I can't. Right? Let me give you... Who compels me to do it? 1 Corinthians 9, 16 to 17. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 to 17. If Jan Lop keeps acting up, send Jan Lop on his merry way because it looks like he's a troll. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 to 17. Let me show you what Paul says.
That's the Holy Spirit, Tony. The Holy Spirit will speak through the servants of Christ to answer prayers that only he knows as a sign to you, Tony. I hear you, Tony. I'm more real than you can imagine. Endure, I am with you. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 to 17. Now notice what Paul says and why he's my hero. For though, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. I can't boast that I preach the gospel. Notice why I love this man, Paul. And when I hear about him, it moves me to tears. And I ask Jesus, if I have found favor in your sight, my Lord. <clears throat> Told you it moves me in my spirit. <clears throat> if I found favor in your sight, make me like Paul, who was so in love with you and was willing to die for you. Right? I tell you, it moves me in my spirit. This man, what Jesus did through him. He's my brother. He's my hero. <clears throat> I love this man. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. Nothing to boast. Why? For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. In other words, if it was something voluntarily I chose to do, then I'd have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. You know what he means? Do you know what he means right here? Let me explain what he means here. He says, I don't do this out of free will. I do it out of compulsion. I am forced and compelled against my will to preach the gospel. It's not something I wanted to do. It's not something I chose. Jesus chose it for me. And I have no choose, choice but to preach the gospel. See what he's saying here? See what he's saying? Now, how did Jesus compel him and force him against his will? Did Jesus compel him and force him out of threat as a dictator, taskmaster? You better. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Jericho, Jesus, my God, is my strength. As long as my strength preserves me, I will not weaken. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. That's what it is. Constraining meaning the love of Christ compels us to do what we do. You see what he said? I am not preaching out of my own free will. I'm being compelled, constrained to preach against my will. But how is Christ compelling me to preach? Not out of fear or threat, out of love. The love of Christ makes it impossible for me not to preach. The love of Christ is so powerful, it overwhelms me and drowns me and makes me want to preach. You know why that's amazing, folks? We, we assume might. We need to use might. We need to strength, threat of violence to make someone do what we want. And yet Jesus conquered hearts, not by force, not by threat of violence, but by love. And you know what Jesus is showing us here? This is what's going to move me in my heart again. You know what Jesus is showing you? Love is the most powerful force in creation. Love conquers everything, conquers all. And you know, see, I'm going to get moved in my spirit. And Jesus proved it. You know what he said? I'm going to show you how to conquer the world. It's not going to be by sword. It's not going to be by threat of violence. I'm going to show you how to conquer the world by loving the world to the point of dying for it. You know what my weapon is? My cross. The cross is my weapon of love. By it, I slay the world out of love. You understand? You, say, you understand that? You understand why that's powerful and it moves me in my heart? Honestly, I'm about to cry again. And I don't want to cry because I don't want people to say, hey, put on a show, you know? No, no. That Jesus conquered. <clears throat> Jesus conquered. <laughs> Jesus conquered. <clears throat> He conquered me <clears throat> by his love. 
not by threat. I know he's almighty, he can destroy me, but you know what? I don't feel threatened by Jesus. You know why I say that? Because I know how much he loves me, he's in love with him, and I'm in love with him. So you see what Paul said? Paul said, I am compelled to preach. It's not my free will. I wasn't looking for Jesus. Jesus found me, and he compels me by his love. His love for me makes it impossible for me not to preach. I have no choice because his love overwhelms me. And I endure pain, suffering, imprisonment to make sure you get saved. Right? Is it Jesus amazing or what? Let me give you two stories. One that Big Al can confirm. Big Al can confirm. He knows that sister in the Lord. True story. Big Al, you're here. Al Dariush, my boy. Big Al, for you guys, uh, pray for him. Pray God will bless him and his family and his provision, his work. Pray for a situation that Jesus will deliver him. He is a godly man. He's a good man, a man of integrity. And he is one of my best friends, dearest friends. He's a brother that we know face to face. Al Dariush, Big Al. He's right here. He's listening. Okay? Okay, so Big Al, you're going to tell me if I'm lying. He knows who they are. Okay? And in fact, I'm going to just text it to him because I can't mention their name. See, Al Dario, she's right there. Okay? I can't mention it on screen because I don't have the permission. Okay, I'm texting it. I got his number. He's my bro. Okay. Okay, now, I just text him. Okay. True story. Because today, Tony said, Sam is a brother. It's like he's speaking to me. You Tony. My, you are my brother. Yes, amen. I love you. Another brother here, dear to my heart. Who let me use his house. Oh, Child of God. It's your house, man. Now, thank it's you, brother. God bless you. Yes, you. Okay. True story. I'm going to share with you a true story. Watch here. Okay. Tony, this is for you, brother, to show you how real Jesus is, that God is answering you, even though I don't know what your situation is. Al Darish will confirm. In the, church, in the Bible study that I used to do in Chicago, there was a young man, and at that time, it was his girlfriend. <clears throat> they came to Bible study because he was going through a hard time, okay? I had only seen that young lady the second time. Prior to that, I'd seen her one time, but it was in the streets. I didn't know her. They came in. It was a Sunday night. I'm preaching. They're about, let's say, five, six rows ahead of me, and I'm preaching locally. I don't know what happened. And all of a sudden, I just out of nowhere, I was talking about God and being aware of everything. And I looked right at their direction and I said, yeah, like some of you told your mom last night. Remember, this was Sunday. So last night was Saturday. You're going to your best friend Susie's house when in reality you were in the nightclubs, gyrating your hips till the morning, sinning against God. Now, when I said that, the young lady sunk in her chair and she tried to hide herself. Okay. Young lady, this is part of her testimony. Now, I didn't know why she did that. When I saw her do that, I was kind of upset, right? Kind of upset. Guess what, folks? You want to hear why she did that? You want to hear why she did that? Why she sunk in after I said that? Turns out that young lady, I found this out a couple of these later. Turns out that young lady had told her mother Saturday night she's going to her best friend Susie's house when she was in the nightclub till the morning. Do you hear what I just said? And that's exactly what I said, and I didn't know her. I told her, yeah, like some of you told your mother, you're hanging out with your best friend Susie when you're in the nightclub. She was so shocked. She knew it was human impossible, humanly impossible for me to know it. Now, Al is right there. Am I lying, brother? This testimony, he knows the people. We're not going to mention their names. She since... Since then, she married, and she has children. God bless her. Al, am I lying? Al Darius, read his comment. He's going to confirm. See? Did you hear it? He's there. He knows the people. What's the point? The point is God is more real than you can imagine, and at times he's going to answer you through people that have no idea what your situation is, but you and God do. Okay? Talk about mind blown. 
I didn't know. And he does it not just through me. I'm nobody special. He just does that to get people's attention. Now, with this passage, 2 Corinthians 1, about consolation. I know someone locally, someone whom I love from my heart. I won't mention his name. Let me tell you his tragic story. His wife left him many moons ago when his children were very young. His son committed suicide. And his daughters are grown. One of them got married and they refused to speak to him because their mother turned the children against him. And if you look at him, a broken man, a humble man, and you see nothing but beauty and love filling him. And when I look at him talking, he understands my situation. When I hear him speak, it makes me want to cry, right? Why did I mention this story? To tie it in with 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 to 6. Now, Anushka, baby, says you were right. Do you know them too, Anushka? What does 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 6 say? It says, God in his wisdom allows you to go through suffering so that he can comfort you with his comfort so that then you can then be a comfort to others. expressing the comfort you experience from God. And it's so true, folks. When I see someone homeless, or I see someone sick, or I see someone in a wheelchair, or I see someone broken, I really hate this world. I get depressed and I want to cry because I go to I say to Jesus, "Lord, how much longer? Lord, how much longer? How much more must we live in this misery, this fallen world?" Lord, you love your creation more than I can imagine. And I'm human. I'm weak. I'm imperfect. It's killing me, Lord. It's eating me inside to see this. And you know what? I ache to leave this world even more. There's only one reason why I'd want to stay behind, so I can be in my daughter's lives. But the more they're away from me, the more I say, okay, Lord, I'm not in their lives. No one can do a better job than you in raising them. Let me know. I'm ready to go. As long as I'm clothed. By your spirit, covered by the blood of Jesus, I'm ready for you to take me. I'm tired of this world. I'm sick of this world. I'm sick of this world. Honestly, I am. Right? It's hard, man. It's hard when I see people with physical ailments and deformities and children. And then when I watch shows and children, I say, Lord, I can't handle this. I'm human. I don't have your heart. I know that these children, you love them. And they'll be in an infinitely better place in your presence, pain-free, cancer-free. But the pain of their parents that they leave behind until, see, these kids that die, I truly believe they're covered by the blood of Jesus. They're in perfect glory, filled with the love. But the parents here, they're heartbroken, devastated. Like this, this man yeah, the, I'm talking about, several days ago, they asked me the question about suicide. Real quickly, I'm sorry I'm going on tangents. I'm sorry, guys, but I want to tell you a story. Unbeknownst to me, his son had committed suicide. You know, so I'm about to cry again, man. Why are you guys making me cry? You're going to make me cry. <clears throat> he was sitting next to me, the poor guy. <clears throat> he was sitting next to me right here. right. And they asked me, when someone commits suicide, does he go to hell? I said, let me tell you something plainly. Okay? Let me tell you something plainly. <laughs> the reason why I'm crying is because then I understood his reaction when he stand next to me. I said, Jesus said there's only one unforgivable sin. He didn't add a second. The only sin he doesn't forgive, blasphemy the Holy Spirit. And committing suicide is not blaspheming the Spirit. That sin can be forgiven. And you know what he did? Why? Um, <clears throat> it moved me. He put his head down. He put his head down, and <clears throat> I know why, because that comforted his heart. Someone had told me that he had said, my son is in the flames now, isn't he? Because he committed suicide, because that's what some tradition taught him. I won't mention the name of the church, but there is a church, there is a tradition that says, hey, man, if he commits suicide, he's in hell, we can't bury him. So when I said to him, <laughs> When I said to him, <clears throat> the only sin that the Lord doesn't forgive 
is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because he said all other sins will be forgiven. Whoever says that someone commits suicide is in hell, shame on him. Right? And he bent over, and I can tell he was moved. This is the kind of pain and suffering that, you know, I'm human, right? I'm human. You know, I'm human. I'm not Jesus. I don't have his heart. I'm human. I'm, I'm you know, I, it bothers me. But anyway, okay, with that said, that was to go back to Vine. Vine, you see God loves all his children and everyone he has created. Exactly, Vine. So you're going to move me with that too. See, Vine, he just said something that touches me too. If theology stays in the head, of what use is it? Theology has to penetrate not just your mind but your heart because theology has to dictate how you live for the Lord and your attitude towards others. Okay. And that's exactly what I feel. What I feel is the heartache of Jesus, not that because I'm Jesus. Folks, can you imagine if it's killing me to see this, what's doing to the heart of Jesus? If I, as a fallen, broken vessel, an image bearer of Christ, is hurt and broken and sad and angry at all this misery, what do you think it's doing to the heart of the triune God? Right? Let me give you an example from Paul. Romans 9. Let's read verses 1 to 3. No, Romans 9, verses 1 to 3. Exactly, Nada. I love your wisdom, sister. You are a soldier of Christ. Romans 9, verses 1 to 3. Watch here. Exactly. I say the truth in Christ. See, Paul's saying, I'm not lying. Before Christ as my judge, my witness, what I'm about to tell you. Okay? I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to confirm that this is some from my heart. I'm not lying in front of you. Holy Spirit bears witness. Christ bears witness. And what do they bear witness to? That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. The triumph God know how heartbroken and sad and depressed I am. For what, Paul? Why are you sad and depressed? For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Did you see what he just said? I would gladly go to hell, be severed from Christ, if Israel would be saved, all of them. Paul is a fallen, imperfect sinner. He does not love as much as Jesus, and he cannot outlove Jesus. Brothers, uh, send Saran out of here because Saran is not patient. He keeps asking me the same question. He hasn't learned his lesson. Send him out of here, please. Because he just asked me the same question 50 times. I think I got to block this guy from my from contacting me ever again. Okay. Brian is talking about his mother eating cow manure, giving birth to a pig like him. But anyway, come back here. See what Paul says. He says, if I could be cut off from Christ and go to hell for the salvation of all the Jews, I'd gladly go to hell if it result in their salvation. You want me there? Now, this is how much Paul loved Israel. He'd go to hell to save them. Are you telling me that Paul loves Israel, loves the lost, more than Jesus or just as much as Jesus? If this is how Paul felt, what do you think the Godhead feels? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You want me there? If this is how Paul felt, a fallen, imperfect sinner, what do you think God's attitude is, the triune God's attitude is towards the lost? You think that Paul can outlove Jesus or love people just as much as Jesus? Exactly, medic. So, Vine, to answer your question, if Paul, a fallen, imperfect vessel, Loves all Israel, even those who reject Christ and under Christ's wrath. You're telling me that he loves them more than Jesus does or just as much as Jesus? To answer your question, the Bible is quite clear. God loves all his creatures because all his creatures were given life by him, are sustained by him, are provided for by him as an expression of his love for them. 
And in that sense, we're all his children, and he's the father of us all. But in that definition, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are our father. The Son and the Spirit are not God the Father. They're not the same person. But if you define Father to me, the one who gives you life, creates you, provides for you, and sustains you, the Bible's clear. The Father, the Son, and Spirit, three distinct persons, together, give all creation life, made all things, and provide for all things. So in that sense, all three of them are our Father in that sense. You want me there? Who knows, awesome, maybe he will. But you do not love God. And you're not more just than God, and you're not more merciful than God. Michelle El Saif, in Jesus' name, the brother will pray for you and everyone else that needs prayers. May the Father of mercies, Michelle, cover you and everyone else with the blood of Jesus and fill you with the Holy Spirit of comfort, drown you and all of us, everyone else, myself, my daughters, in his infinite love, compassion, and joy, and may the blood of Jesus be your shield, our shield, the shield of our loved ones. In my case, my daughters, in Jesus' name. Right? Anyway, I hope that answered your question, Vine. Did that answer your question? Sorry that I go on these tangents, but I hope it helps you. Because they're not tangents, I hope, but that I'm unpacking the scriptures with greater depth so that you can stand in awe of the beauty of the word and the majesty of our God, and how deep the Father's love, how deep the Son's love, how deep the Spirit's love. Right? How deep. Even that song, right? I can't sing it. How deep the Father's love for us. Right? I love that song. Listen to it. Now let's talk about the term Son again. I showed you that the term Son can mean different things in different contexts. And I showed you that there is a type of sonship limited to David and the heirs of his throne. Right? You should have seen me do paparazzi. I'll do it in, in a minute. <clears throat> Vine, you, oh man, Vine. Vine, you know, today I'm getting a little sensitive. Yesterday I was angry because I was going to attack. Today is one of those Sam is a feminine day. Because I'm getting a little sensitive. I'm crying like a big girl. When Vine says, man, most powerfully, you are a big answer to prayer in Providence, you're going to make me cry again. Because my hope, my prayer is, right, my hope and my prayer is that I can be used by King Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit to see people fall in love with Jesus, be in awe of Jesus, <clears throat> that will make me happy. And I pray that the Lord will be patient with me and help me and save me from my failure, my moral failure, so I don't grieve him because I do. Because you know what? There is no greater joy in my heart but to see people in love with my Lord, my Savior. When I see you guys in tears or rejoicing or in love with Jesus, you know what that does? <laughs> it makes me happy. <clears throat> and I pray for one thing. My angels fall in love with Jesus and delight in Jesus. I'm done. I'll say, Lord, <clears throat> your servant is done. The race is finished. Lord, I'm tired. Take me home. I'm ready to go home now. <clears throat> I'm ready to enter your presence and just finally rest. Psalms, I challenged him. He won't debate me. He wants to fight me first. I said, debate me, then I will destroy you in a fight and bury you like Jesus buried Muhammad. Right? Yeah. It's hard, Sophia, not to be emotional because the love of Jesus takes even steel and melts it. Steel melts like butter before the presence of Jesus' love, right? Okay. Now, let's look at Hebrews 1, 4, 3 to 5 one more time so we can continue. Then I can get into G Genesis 6, Job 1, Job 2, Job 38. Thank you, sister, Marine Dahul. By the way, for those of you who don't know, Marine Dahul is another warrior of Christ. She's an Assyrian sister, a dear friend of mine, her and her sister Shami. Dear dear sisters who loved me and supported me, pray for Maureen Dahul. Pray for her family. She too is going through a trial, which I won't mention, but she's a sister who loves Jesus. Al Darius knows her. Maureen Ushemmi. Really, Don, Johnny Two Shoes? Let's send Johnny Two Shoes with a third pair of shoes. Send them out of here. All right, Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. 
Yeah. Oh, this dog also sent me a comment. Hold on. Say the dog couldn't help himself. He's a dog of Muhammad. What are you going to do, man? These these dogs of Muhammad. They're coming. Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. He goes, soon you'll be in, my, in the grave. Well, no, I'm not going to be in the grave with your prophet. He's burning in hell. I'm going to be with Jesus in glory. Amen? By the blood of Jesus. <whistles> Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. Focus. Okay. How deep the Father's love for us. All right. Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. Let's read. <clears throat> Pay attention. This is from yesterday's discussion. The thing is, I don't see verse 3. My brother Protestant, he reads numericals as if he's reading Chinese characters. <laughs> Just kidding, Protestant. Protestant, I don't pay you nothing for nothing, all right? You keep it up, and I'm going to stop paying you nothing for what you're doing. No, he's a blessing to me, right? Pay attention now, Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. Who being the brightness of his glory... And the express image of his person. Jesus is the brightness of God's glory, the exact representation of God's person, his being, upholding all things by the word of his power. Now notice, when he, Jesus, had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So he sat down on the throne at God's right hand. Now notice it says, from that vantage point, being made so much better than the angels, he became better than the angels. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And then he quotes the Old Testament to prove Jesus is better, greater, superior to angels. Now notice what he quotes, Hebrews 1.5. <clears throat> Hebrews 1.5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, to which angels did God the Father say, Thou art my son, this day I've begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. The answer is, God never said to any angelic creature. God never said to any angelic creature, you are my son, today I've begotten you. I will be a father to him, he'll be a son to me. Right? You understand what the inspired author of Hebrews is saying? What tradition says was Paul? Let's focus now, because we're going to go into the meat. Let's focus. Okay, so what passages did he cite to show Jesus fulfilled these promises, a promise given to David and his descendants, but to no angelic creature? What passages did he cite? He was citing Psalm 2, 7. We're going to read Psalm 2, 6 and 7. And 2 Samuel 7, verse 14, also found in 1 Chronicles 17, verse 13. So, Protestant, post Psalm 2, verses 6 to 7 first. Psalm 2, verses 6 to 7. Psalm 2, 6 to 7. This is what he quoted in Hebrews 1, 5. Watch here. How come you guys haven't blocked Abdullah al-Mansuri? Read with me. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. God is speaking. I've set my king in Jerusalem. Zion is a hill in Jerusalem. Zion is a hill in Jerusalem. I will declare the decree. Jehovah hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. See, this is the passage that Hebrews quotes in reference to Christ going to heaven sitting on the throne, fulfilling Psalm 2-7. It's talking about the Israelite king, the Davidic king from the line of King David, being enthroned in Zion, in Jerusalem, and on the day of his enthronement, God announcing, this is my son. You caught it? When does God say to the king, you are my son? He says, today I've begotten you. This word today in context refers to what? In Psalm 2, forget Hebrews 1 now. In Psalm 2, it says, today I've begotten you. This is the day you've become my son. What day is God referring to in the context of Psalm? It's right there in verse 6. Don't guess, folks. Psalm 2, 6 to 7. See, I just said it's in the context. I knew someone's going to say past eternity. 
I'll give you 10 million bucks if you show me past eternity. So you guys are not paying attention. See, that's why I said. Joel Glenn Davis and Medic for Christ got it. God bless you. The day he sat enthroned in Jerusalem. Thank you, Alex. Masori's not listening either. Alex, Joel, Medic, you got it. The day when the king began ruling on the throne in Zion, that's the day he becomes God's son. It's right there. Psalm 2, 6 to 7. I don't know how clear I can say the answer is in verse 6. All the kings of Judah that came from David ruled in Jerusalem in Zion. So, Mickey, it's not just David. It's all the kings of Israel. Did everyone get it? Did you see it before you go on? Good, Psalm. If someone's not getting it, ask me to clarify. I don't want to move on until you get this point. Please, you got to get this point. Anyone confused? Say, man, I'm confused. All right. If you got it, notice that according to the Old Testament, David and his sons were adopted into God's family as his sons, in a sense, not true of anyone else. Not true of anyone else. Okay. Not true of anyone else. This type of sonship is given only to David and his heirs, those sons of his who would sit on the throne in Jerusalem representing God in heaven. If you go back to yesterday's session, I'm going to repeat it again. God, before Christ died and rose again, God had two thrones, one in heaven that he occupies, the other on earth in Jerusalem, given to David and his heirs. Yep, Medic, it is a coronation rite. You got it. Bam, you got it. Everyone getting it? If everyone got it, you're going to see why this is amazing and important. According to Hebrews chapter 1, Jesus fulfilled Psalm 2-7 when he went to heaven and sat on God's throne in heaven. That's when Psalm 2-7 was fulfilled in Jesus. After his resurrection and ascension to heaven, sitting on heaven's throne. You with me there? That's Hebrews 1, 3-5. That's what he said. After he purged our sins by himself... He sat on the right hand of the majesty on high, and that's when he became better than the angels and fulfilled Psalm 2-7. That's the sequence of Hebrews 1, 3 to 5. Okay, now, folks, can you listen attentively and follow me? The context of Psalm 2-7 says, no, you need Jesus, and Jesus will raise up people to bless you, Anoshka. Okay, and if he wants to use me, Amen. The context of Psalm 2 says that the king becomes God's son when he sits on the throne in Zion. And Zion's on earth, right? But then Jesus fulfilled this psalm when he went to heaven and sat on the throne of the Father in heaven. But wait, that's not Zion, is it? Zion is on earth, right? So how did he fulfill it? How do you fulfill it, folks? Because there are two Zions and two Jerusalems. There's a Zion on earth and a Zion in heaven. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Exactly, Alex. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Let me show you what the scripture is trying to unfold to blow you away. Yeah, even when he returns, he's going to rule in earthly Zion, but he's currently ruling as a Davidic son of God, as an heir of David in heavenly Zion. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Read with me, folks. Read, please. But ye are come unto Mount Sion. What Sion? Unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So there's a Zion in heaven, a Jerusalem in heaven, and to innumerable company of angels, to the great general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all. So God the Father is there visibly. 
Angels are there in heaven visibly. There is a church of believers having church in heaven and there visibly, meaning visibly to those who are there. They see them. Also there are the spirits of just men made perfect. So the spirits of believers who've died, bodies go to the dust, their spirits are there, and now they're perfect and complete. But who else is there? 24. And to Jesus, the meteor of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Did you catch it? Jesus is reigning in Zion on the throne as a son of David. And Netta, again, in her brilliance, on earth as it is in heaven. Bang! There is a Jerusalem on earth, a Zion on earth, as there's one in heaven. And the heavenly Jerusalem and Zion are the reality of which the one on earth is simply a shadow. I like Groin's uh, imagery. Did everyone catch it? Fine. Are you catching the import of this? Jesus began ruling in Zion when he rose from the dead and entered heaven. Because he's now ruling in heavenly Zion, in heavenly Jerusalem, in the heavenly temple, on the heavenly throne. Following me? Everyone got it or no? Because I'm going to move to the next point. But it says that when Jesus began ruling in heaven on God's throne, he fulfilled Psalm 2-7. Folks, Psalm 2-7 is a statement about David and his physical descendants ruling on God's throne. How did Jesus fulfill this promise to David and his heirs to his throne? What does this tell you? And if you guys remember my session on Jesus not being the Archangel Michael, I mentioned it back then, but we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of God's Spirit. Okay. You understand what the message of the New Testament is? One of the main, many messages? Get ready to be blown away. Okay. Here. You now have, for the first time in the history of heaven... A physical human being, a physical descendant of David, reigning on the throne of God in heaven. Prior to that, all the physical descendants of David reigned on God's earthly throne in earthly Jerusalem. For the first time in the history of heaven, a physical man entered heaven as a physical son of David, sitting on heaven's throne, as a physical descendant of David and as the divine son of God. He transferred David's throne from earth to heaven. And then will return it to the earth again at his second coming. I want it to sink in. Everyone got it? Who is not getting it? Vine, are you there? I don't know if Vine is here. You caught what Jesus did? Jesus took the earthly throne of Jehovah, gifted to David, to heaven, and will bring it back down to the earth again. So for the first time, in the creation of heaven, you now have a man on the throne of heaven with the Father. Uh, Midditch, are you serious? Did you read the context that Paul says God fulfilled the promise to our fathers, the promise of David after resurrection? Because what happened after the resurrection? Did he go swimming in Hawaii? Let's see how you're going to answer it. Why did he say it was fulfilled at the resurrection? Because what happened after the resurrection, Midditch? Did he go fishing in Hawaii? I say nothing about it, Jonathan Doodle. So after the resurrection means what, according to Paul Midditch? Help me understand. 
I know you're what you're quoting. Acts 13, 32 to 33. But if you start from Acts 13, 22, 23, he mentions David and the promises to David. And then if you read Acts 13, 34 to 35, he again mentions David. Yeah, he went to America. So thank you, Minich. You answered your own question. The reason why it's fulfilled by the resurrection, because the resurrection was necessary for him to then enter heaven. So the resurrection is the sign and seal from God Christ is not dead, but rose immortal and now lives in heaven. Right? So what's the problem, Mitch? And don't just start at 32, 33. Start at 22 and 23 and read 34 and 35. Right, Mitch? So, but what's the point? The point is the New Testament is teaching a physical son of David, a physical heir of David, Entered heaven, not just as God, the divine son, who has rights to the heavenly throne, but as a physical son of David, reigns on the throne. In other words, even though Jesus is God, the eternal word, the eternal son of God, and heaven's throne is his by right, he's now ruling from it, not just as the son of God, but as the physical son of David, as the God-man, exalting David's throne to heaven. Yep, exactly, anointed. He had set apart his authority as king while on earth, waiting to be exalted and coronated again in heaven. And anointed, didn't Jesus say that? That on earth, he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45, Matthew 20, 28. And Luke 22, 27, he says, I'm among you as one who serves. Right? Luke 22, 27. And Joel Glenn Davis, here's what's shocking. The absolute sovereignty of all creation isn't simply his by virtue of him being God. Because as God, he is sovereign. He's now exercising that sovereignty as the God-man, as the son of God and heir of David. Thereby elevating humanity to the position of authority over the rest of creation. You, you there? Is it making sense? I don't know if I confuse any of you. Okay. Joel, when Jesus is given all authority, he doesn't simply exercise authority as God. He's exercising it as the God-man. As the son of God and the physical heir of David, he now possesses absolute sovereignty over all creation in order to elevate us and represent us in his rule over creation because man was given authority over creation and authority that he lost because of sin, but now restored and being exercised by our representative. Christ is ruling not just as David's heir, but as the representative of all mankind. He is exercising his authority as the last Adam on our behalf in our place until the consummation of the age where then he'll give it to us and say, here, you now reign over creation, a creation that I reconciled, a dominion that I restored and which I exercised on your behalf until now I give it to you. Why do you think the scripture says we are a kingdom of priests? Exactly, Joel Glenn Davis, 100%. Why do you think it says we will be kings and queens on thrones ruling over the earth? Revelation 5, 9 and 10. Because dominion was given to man, a dominion that was lost, but now restored in Christ as our representative, as our head, a man standing in our place on the throne, representing us in his rule, a rule which he will then give back to us, and allow us to rule a restored creation under his authority forever. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. Here it is. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. Read. Exactly, Billy Mandalay. Here, I'm not making it up. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. 
For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Did you catch it? We are kings, not just priests. And we will rule on the earth and over the earth because God created Adam to rule the physical creation and have angels subject to him. But when Adam sinned, he became enslaved to Satan and Satan's dominion, handed the authority to Satan, and he became enslaved to sin. And Jesus becomes man to be our brother representing us, restoring the dominion that Satan stole to us. No, I can't answer you, son guy. Not right now. Right? You see what Jesus is doing? He doesn't simply die to pay the debt of your sin. He came to do a lot more. He came to restore your glory that you lost because of sin. He came to make you partakers of the divine nature again. Because before, prior to the sin of Adam and Eve, they were morally perfect beings radiating with the glory of God, designed to live forever, disease-free, pain-free. But because of sin, they lost that glory. They lost that status, became subject to decay and death. And now Christ says, I'm going to restore all of that. I'm going to bring us back to the Garden of Eden where there will be no more sin to destroy things again. You will be glorious again. You will be immortal again. You'll be indestructible again because I will make it where you won't be able to sin again. And I'm going to restore dominion to you once again. Right? You get it now? Revelation 1, 5 to 6, in case you're not getting it. I think I'm going to have to do a third part in this session. Revelation 1, verses 5 to 6. A lot of meat, right? And I don't want to go too fast so I don't lose you. Amen. You got it, Doc Savage. Revelation 1, verses 5 to 6. 1, 5 to 6. You keep getting it wrong. I'm going to have to fire you, Protestant. I can't wait for your glorification where you won't make mistakes anymore. Revelation 1, verses 5 to 6. Okay. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Did you catch it? What part of the New Testament teaching that we are restored to be kings and queens, ruling a restored earth forever? No more sin, no more pain, no more decay, no more misery, no more Satan. What part of that isn't clear? God bless you, Rob Christian. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 5. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 5. And then I'm going to shock you guys. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 5. Let me now introduce something else, but just to shock you. Watch here. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Watch this, guys. Please read and watch. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. Hmm, sound familiar? Why is John using the imagery of the tree of life? Because he's telling you the garden has been restored. Paradise is on earth again. 
What we lost in Genesis, restored by the last Adam. Praise you, Lord Jesus, the last Adam. You have restored the tree of life and paradise to us again. On either side of there was the tree of life, which bare 12 manner fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. In this restoration of the garden, no more curse, no more sin, no more serpent. So history doesn't repeat itself again. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. Now notice verse 5. Verse 5. We lost verse 5. And there shall be no night there. Continuous light. The light of the Godhead. And they need no candle. Neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Wow. Did you catch it? Folks, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? I'm going to ask you two questions. Are you ready? Two questions. Are you ready for the two questions? Okay. Number one, it says the glorified believers, human beings who are glorified, made immortal, they will reign forever. However, in the new heavens, new earth, there are no more wicked sinners. All sinners will be erased from the earth, right? No more wicked sinners. And believers don't rule over one another because we're all one body and we rule fully over the earth. Who will believers be ruling over in the new heavens and new earth when there are no more unbelievers, no more sin, no more Satan? Who will we rule over? Notice we'll still be serving the Godhead. We'll still be subject to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as our God. You guys got it. We'll be ruling over angels, animals, the physical earth. Wow. No, you won't be ruling over them. They're not going to be on earth, Remy. You're not getting it. It's only the righteous. No more wickedness. No more sin. No... That means you will not rule over one another, rule over angels, and rule over animals, just like it was designed before the fall. Revelation 2 7. Revelation 2 7. Exactly, first and last. Yep, even angels. Revelation 2, 7, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Wow, here's paradise restored, the tree of life in paradise. But notice what's not there, the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. Medic, why would you want to go to different planets when the entire heaven will be on earth? Why do you want to go to Mars? Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. Okay, Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4. And I saw a new heaven, new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. No more continents divided. One huge landmass, so we can all be connected. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Did you catch? Remember what I said earlier? Heavenly Jerusalem, heavenly Zion will come down to the earth. So Jesus took David's throne to heaven and will bring it back down to the earth with heavenly Jerusalem itself coming down to the earth. New Jerusalem coming down from heaven, from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Could it be any clearer, folks?
So did you understand what's going on? There's a heavenly Jerusalem, a heavenly Zion. Okay? Earthly Jerusalem, earthly Zion. David and his heirs ruled on God's earthly throne in earthly Jerusalem. Jesus became a physical heir of David to inherit the promises of David, to represent David on the throne, but with one difference. He took David's throne from the earth and now made it one with God's throne in heaven. So Jesus is in heavenly Jerusalem, heavenly Zion, sitting on heaven's throne as a physical heir of David and the Son of God, thereby representing David on God's heavenly throne, the first time in the history of heaven, a man ruling on the throne, a man who is also God. So the God-man, the Son of David, the Son of God, reigns in heaven's throne. And then he's going to bring the throne of David back to the earth and heavenly Jerusalem to the earth. Because a lion will no longer eat flesh. It's going to be complete peace even among the animals. Clear? Did it make sense? I don't know if I'm putting you asleep, boring you, because I'm losing people. We're dropping. Did it make sense? Is it sinking in the redemption of God, the plan of God's redemption? It is so multifaceted, so rich, and so deep. I know, Imran Khan, I'm so finished. I'm finished like your prophet who's burning in hell under the feet of Jesus. What you want to do to Muhammad Nikab because of your mouth? Right? So deep, right? So beautiful. So rich, so deep. And so what you have in Jesus, look at his love for you. This should move you in your spirit. What you have in Jesus is someone who became a physical human, a physical son of David for two reasons. To represent David on the throne and to represent humanity in their restoration of having dominion over the earth, a dominion given to Adam, but forfeited by Adam because of sin, but now regained by the last Adam. In other words, what you have in heaven is Jesus on the throne saying, I am now representing humanity on the throne, ruling creation in their place, on their behalf, until the restoration of things, and then I'll hand it back to them. You got it? This is why in Ephesians 2, 6, it says, Those are redeemed, born again, made alive. Where are you now? In Ephesians 2, verse 6. Ephesians 2, verse 6. Yeah, I'm going to have to do a part three. Ephesians 2, verse 6. Yep, I'm going to have to do part three. Watch here. Those are redeemed, made alive. Notice what it says, folks. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see what it says? If you're one with Christ in the spirit, belong to his body, you are ruling with him on the throne because he's ruling on your behalf in your place as your representative. So consider yourself already ruling in heaven with him. Guaranteed, done deal. He's restored you. And the earth, the animals, and the angels will be subject to you. Everyone got it? Do you see Ephesians 2.6, what it said? Post it one more time so if they can read it. Just one more time. We're almost done. The admins will get rid of the sons of Satan if they're distracting. Let's see. 
and hath raised us up together. We who are born of the Spirit, made alive in Christ, raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly place in Christ Jesus. Right now you are sitting because your head sits on the throne on your behalf. Right? So when Jesus returns to the earth and transforms the earth and destroys all wickedness and unrighteousness on the earth, believers who are united to him will be glorified, immortalized, and rule the earth under the headship of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, rule over animals, plants, the seas, the dry land, and angels. If that point is clear, I can make one final point. We'll be done for today. And I have to do a part three. Right? So what was the point of Hebrews 1? Before I go there, folks, you read clearly. You read clearly that we who are in Christ, purchased by Christ, transformed by Christ, we are kings and queens, right? You read in Revelation 1, 6, Revelation 5, 10, Revelation 22, verse 5, right? No, this is part two of yesterday's talk. Ron M., the other session I did earlier, I didn't touch on any of this. We went into other important issues. Right? Okay. Folks, even if you don't believe this teaching, understand where I'm getting at. If all believers in Christ who are reconciled in Christ, who will rule with Christ, and Ephesians 2.6 says you're ruling with him already as your representative. How far off is it? I'm not saying it's biblical or accepted, but I want you to think now and understand why people believe what they do and see it from their perspective. See it from their perspective. If something is blasphemous, heretical, reject it. But not everything you think is heretical is heretical if you understand it properly. How far off and how wrong is it to say that Christ in his grace has already crowned Mary to rule as queen in heaven, something that will be given to all believers eventually, but she enjoys it right now by grace beforehand? How far off or how heretical is that? Even if it's wrong, let's say. Even if it's wrong. Is it really heretical and blasphemous to say that Mary reigns as queen in heaven if all of us will rule as kings and queens? Now, I'm not talking about whether it's true historically, Adam. You're not understanding my question. Because you have people attacking those who believe and saying, that's heretical, that's blasphemous, that's idolatry. Really, is it? Is it really? So when all believers who are glorified will rule and reign, that's blasphemous too? I'm not saying it's historical or biblical. And biblical history is true history. Right. What I'm saying is when you see when you see someone saying Mary's the queen of heaven, what people stupidly do. And I was stupid enough to do it. I, I confess my stupidity because I wasn't thinking critically. I would go to Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 44. Look, God is condemning the Israelites for baking cakes, the women to the queen of heaven. The Judean woman. See, the queen of heaven. That's a pagan concept. It's a. Thank Jesus he saved me from my stupidity. The reason why that was sin in Jeremiah 7 and 44 is because the queen of heaven, right, Eshtar or Tammuz, was a pagan goddess. She was a part of the pantheon of gods and goddesses who was sexually immoral and wicked. How is that analogous to the belief that Mary is a human creature, not a goddess, who out of the love for his mother was exalted by Jesus. Jesus exalted her to share in his reign something he will confer on all believers because all of us will share in his reign. Right. Eshtar. You want me there? Thank you, Nana. So that what I want you to think about. I'm not saying it's biblical or it's historical. What I'm saying is 
What I'm saying is, Panagia, exactly. She is the all holy. She is now made all holy and perfect in the presence of her beloved son, the Lord Jesus. Panagia, I love that word. What I'm trying to get at, I'm not trying to be a crowd pleaser, tickle ears, but I want you guys to stop being reactionary, think more deeply and spiritually say, wait, wait, okay. In concept, if all of us are going to be kings and queens, reigning with Christ over creation, then in theory, to have Mary already ruling with Christ, that is not blasphemous or heretical because we're all going to reign, rule with Christ over the earth. So I may not agree with it, but it's not damnable heresy. You get it? You see my point? Letton, I did a six series on communion of saints. Look at, look at it. Go well, listen to it. Six part series on praying or asking saints in heaven to pray for us. I'm not going to answer now. Go listen to it. Okay, now let's end Hebrews 1 and part 3 tomorrow with the angels. Part 3 will be tomorrow, God willing, if the Lord Jesus. Oh, and by the way, I have to address this. Someone sent me out of their love, sent me, that I need to stop saying inshallah when I say God willing, if the Lord wills. Now, number one, I don't ever recall saying inshallah. I don't use that term. I do say, if the Lord wills, God willing, if the Lord Jesus permits. This person meant well, but again, this exposes biblical ignorance on the part of Christians. You know, you're commanded to always say, if the Lord wills. Do you remember when Christian Prince chided? Muhammad Nikab and his boyfriend, and it said that you have to say inshallah. Do you know why? Because Muhammad stole this from the Bible. Do you know that in the Bible, you're commanded to say, if the Lord wills, whenever you talk about doing something? James chapter 4, verses 13 and 15. Hopefully, the person will hear this and never assume that saying, if the Lord wills, is not biblical. In fact, not to say it is unbiblical. James 4, verses 13 and 15. James 4, verses 13 and 15. Okay, let's read. Here, it's a command. James 4, 13 and 15. Guys, take a moment to read it. Go to now, go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Notice again what he says. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. How are you planning ahead? You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, because you may die today, because you're a vapor, you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Why in the world would a Christian tell me, stop saying, if the Lord wills, you sound like Muslim. Because Muslims say that when it's a command from the revelation of the true God. James tells me by inspiration spirit, you need to say, ought to say, if the Lord wills, I'm going home. If the Lord wills, I'm going to the store. If the Lord wills, I'll be here tomorrow. Because it may not be the will of the Lord for you to be on earth tomorrow. Do you see it? Did I make it up or does it say it? There. You ought to say, if the Lord wills. And then notice the warning in 1617. Now that you know what you're supposed to do, and if you don't do it, you're sinning. Here, James 1, 16, uh, James 4, same chapter 4, 16 to 17. 1617. The two verses that come right after. James 4, 16 to 17. Yep, they're right. But now you rejoice in your boastings, you brag in your pride. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now you're stuck. James says, to him who knows the good he's supposed to do, like saying, if the Lord wills, if you don't do it, you are sinning by not doing what God wants you to do. You caught it? Oh, Serenity, you're there? <laughs> I didn't mention you, sister, my beloved sister. Okay, sister. Do you want me to mention who asked me the question? Poor girl. I, I tried not to mention the identity. 
And I said, it's a, it's a believer in the Lord. All right. But thank you for being here. You are my sister and this is your channel. I just want to know if you guys are on drugs, send me some because I can use them. You know what I'm saying? All right. I guess the person let the cat out of the bag. Right. But now, no, I don't feel better. Why would I feel better? I was making a point. I didn't mention your name, but you let, let the cat out of the bag. I don't feel better. I'm laughing because you show grace and humbleness in accepting correction. Pray I can do likewise. And I pray in Jesus' name, if you give me advice that is something I really need to do, I do it. But that statement was not right. You get my point, Serenity? I'm not rejoicing I won. I'm rejoicing that you accepted correction. That tells me that your heart is tender and you love the Lord and his word and will be corrected. Pray for me to have that same spirit. But here I wasn't wrong. That's why I didn't repent. You know what I'm saying? Even though I'm an arrogant Jilu, I'm a handsome arrogant Jilu. Come on, don't lie, don't hate. I'm a handsome arrogant snot. At least I'm handsome, right? I'm not rejoicing. I'm rejoicing because you saw what the Bible says and you accepted correction, right? Okay, everyone there? Okay, Hebrews 1, this is what delights my heart, folks, by the way. You know, it delights my heart when we have a brother and sister who's wrong about something. And when they see they're wrong, out of their love for Jesus, they accept correction because they want to be biblical. That makes me happy. Lord Jesus, richly bless serenity and every one of you. Bless you with perfect health, provision, and everlasting life that together forever, all of us will be before the feet of Jesus. Right? And medic for Christ, you'll always suck as an apologist. Just want you to know that. But I still love you. Okay? You suck, buddy. Okay, Hebrews 1, let's finish it. Hebrews 1, let's finish it. I did two sessions, two hours each. God willing, Lord Jesus willing, if the chime God wills, I'll be here tomorrow. Right? Exactly. And Psalms, you're so humble about your humbleness. You're even humble in confessing your humbleness to others. All right. Anyway, Hebrews 1.5, finally. Let's finish it because I'm going to unpack it tomorrow. Hebrews 1.5. I know Psalm was joking. Hebrews 1 verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Guys, remember what kind of sonship this passage is speaking of. It's talking about Davidic royal sonship. What do I mean? This type of sonship is given only to David and his physical heirs, those sons of his that sit on the throne on behalf of David on earth, which then Jesus took to heaven. Okay. Here the author is saying, did God ever call an angel that kind of son? Did God call an angel that kind of son? What kind of son? Someone who reigns on God's throne in the place of David on behalf of David as a physical heir of David. Has God ever given an angel that kind of sonship? And by angel we mean a created angelic being, an angelic creature. An angel who's a creature, an angel by nature, because he's created to serve and be a messenger. Has God ever given that honor to any angel that he should be a Davidic royal son of God, a son of God from David's line, sitting on the throne on David's behalf? No, right? But this destroys the Jehovah's Witnesses. How can Jesus then be an archangel, the archangel Michael? Because Jesus became that kind of son of God, a Davidic royal son of God, when he became a physical descendant of David, and as a physical descendant of David, sits on the throne of heaven on behalf of David, his physical father, representing him. If Jesus is an archangel, then God could not have said to Jesus, you are my son in that sense. Right? So much for JW's belief 
Jesus is a spirit creature, an archangelic creature, right? This will then help you understand there is no contradiction in the Old Testament where angels are called sons of God and with Hebrews 1. Because in the Old Testament, God willing, tomorrow I'm going to show you that when the Old Testament calls angels the sons of God, it's using the term son differently from the way it's used in Hebrews 1.5. Right? You got it? Angels are the sons of God in a particular son, sense, but they are not the sons of God in this sense of Hebrews 1.5. Remember how I started yesterday's session? The term son of God can have different meanings depending on the context. So yes, angels are sons of God in a particular sense, but they are not the son of God in this sense in Hebrews 1.5. Just like every creature that God made is a son or daughter of God, but not every creature is a son of God covenantally because to be that kind of son of God, you need to believe in Christ, be born of the spirit of Christ, transform to then conform to the image of Christ and share in the inheritance of Christ. And I unpacked that in yesterday's session by the grace of the triune God, right? So let's end it with Revelation 22, verse 16. So get ready for part three, God willing, tomorrow. Pray I'm filled with the Spirit that my daughters and I are sealed by the Spirit, covered by the blood of Jesus, that Jesus protects us. They outlive me until the Lord comes and provides for us and gives me divine favor with the authorities here in Jesus' name. Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Folks, this is after Jesus went to heaven. He's now glorious. He's in a state of glory on the throne, reigning as king of kings and lord of lords. So in heaven, notice what he says to John. Notice he doesn't say, I was. Notice he says, I am right now, John, in heaven, in my glorified state. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Wait, Jesus, in heaven right now on the throne as king of kings and lord of lords, you are, not was, a physical descendant of David. I am David's offspring right now in heaven. So wait. Now, as we speak, now Jesus in heaven is a son of David, a physical son of David. Tomorrow, he'll still be a physical son of David. When he returns, he'll still be a physical son of David. Lord bless you, Nana. Praise the triune God. So do you see you have a physical son of David in heaven sitting on the Father's throne. As a physical son of David and as God Almighty, the eternal word, the eternal son of the Father. Right? You get it? So here's the icing on the cake. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. Hope you're blown away, blessed and encouraged. And I'm going to tell you how to keep praying for me and then I'll see you tomorrow, God willing. Revelation 5, verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Folks, I'm confused. How can Jesus in heaven still have a tribe? A physical tribe, tribal affiliation. He is of the tribe of Judah in heaven. How? Because he's still physical, he's still human, and he belongs to Judah and David physically. And because he'll never stop being physical, he'll never stop being human, he'll never stop being a physical descendant of David and physically from the tribe of Judah. He'll forever exist as a physical Jew who is God in the flesh. So folks, please, if you love me, have your churches and others pray and fast for me and my daughters. 
that Jesus makes me holy and saves me from my own flesh, saves my children, covers us by the blood of Jesus, fills us with the spirit, provide for our provisions. So we beg no man, but trust in him for our provision, never lacking. Give me favor with the authorities to stay planted, to start local Bible studies, to grow in my knowledge, understanding and holiness and purity and love for God and for you, right? <clears throat> and that he will give us the grace to finish the race with honor and integrity and to continue to build up the YouTube channel, the web pages with more information that's accurate so that all of you will be blessed and you will grow and use this information in your churches with your neighbors to evangelize the lost until every knee bows and every tongue confesses Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. So hit the like button, subscribe, pass it on, and Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow if the Lord wills and pray for that provision. I don't want to get another text message from this family member. You should be ashamed of yourself. Be ashamed of yourself. You know why? Because they're begging people for money. All right. No, I beg Jesus, and the Lord uses his people to provide for his servants. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Amen? Amen. Love you guys, and Jesus loves you more. And do pray for my 9-year-old and 7-year-old, Zippy Zippers and Soraya. God bless you.